The faces of two smiling men, Raymond C. Hoyles and Clarence H. Hoyles, greet workers of the Orange County Register as they enter from the first floor parking structure. The bronze plaque depicts father and firstborn son. But what if instead of two, three men were depicted there? Would the outcome have been different? Would a devastating bankruptcy have been avoided? Would the Hoyles family still own Freedom Communications, one of the largest media companies in the country, with its 33 daily newspapers, more than 70 weeklies, eight television stations, and a growing internet presence? Now it is likely forever lost to them and in the hands of investors and banks. The story of how this came to be is rooted in family, philosophy, and changing times. It begins in Alliance, Ohio, on November 24, 1878, with the birth of Raymond Cyrus Hoyles, or R.C., as he was known for most of his life. He grew up in the small town, studied electrical engineering at Mount Union College, and sold subscriptions to his brother Frank's newspaper, The Alliance Review. R.C. abandoned engineering after graduation and started working full-time at the paper on the business side. By the age of 27, he owned one-third of the review. He had also married his local sweetheart, Mabel Myrtle Crum. They had four children, Clarence, Raymond, Harry, and Mary Jane. Raymond, the second son, died of pneumonia when he was eight. R.C. and his brother Frank bought two more Ohio dailies. Over time, R.C. served as publisher of both. He held strong beliefs and wanted them known. He railed against labor unions. His brother Frank refused to publish his strong words. That led to the first family breakup in 1921. Frank ended up with full ownership of the Alliance paper. R.C. bought out all interests in the other two. I believe the newspaper business is one of the most important of all businesses, R.C. wrote. It is a business that can do a lot of good or a lot of harm. It cannot do very much good unless it is consistent and stands for principles that are in harmony with natural moral law. It didn't take long before R.C.'s strong views and personality embroiled him in a local controversy. Attempts were made on his life. When a bomb exploded on his front porch, R.C. had enough. He moved west and purchased the Santa Ana Register in 1935. The county at that time had only about 118,000 residents, but the land was fertile and the climate exceptional. The paper grew along with the place and ultimately became the crown jewel of his publishing empire. It also became the pulpit for R.C.'s lowercase l libertarian beliefs. He thought the rights of the individual and personal freedom were paramount. He believed government should be limited to critical functions like defense of the nation, and even there believed only voluntary service appropriate. He argued, bantered, badgered, and engaged almost anyone who would stop and listen. He railed against what he called tax-supported schools. He took strong, sometimes unpopular stands. He was one of the few publishers to come out against the internment of Japanese citizens during World War II. His stated beliefs were simple. The Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, and the Declaration of Independence. His papers strengthened the communities they served. Employees, known as associates, were treated fairly and honorably. His family all took part in running the growing empire. Clarence joined R.C. as registered co-publisher. Harry ran the Colorado Springs Gazette-Telegraph. Mary Jane and her husband Bob Hardy oversaw the Marysville Appeal Democrat in Northern California. R.C.'s plan was to have Clarence's oldest son, James, take over the business. But when James died in 1964, at age 34, no new successor was named, an uncertainty that undermined future governance. R.C. died six years later at 91. He left one-third of the business to each of his children. Harry was summoned to Orange County to join his ailing brother Clarence. The business grew along with the size of the family. Factions formed. With R.C. gone and Clarence growing sicker, Harry wanted his chance. Others disagreed. 
His sister Mary Jane said she would not support Harry, calling him a disruptive influence, saying he was even more zealous than R.C. Others felt that Harry didn't have the skills to manage the growing company. If he couldn't run the company, Harry wanted out. As one-third owner, he demanded one-third of $830 million, his valuation of the company. He was offered $74 million. Harry sued in 1982 to sell the company and have the shares divided up. In 1985, as the litigation dragged on, he offered to buy freedom from the rest of the family. His first offer was $900 million. Then, a little more than $1 billion. He was rebuffed. A trial judge denied Harry's suit in 1987. Harry appealed, but lost again in the state Supreme Court. Despite tremendous growth of the register, Orange County, and the rest of freedom, the battle had taken its toll in legal costs, estimated at more than 10 million, and deep resentments and fissures within the family. Harry died in 1998. His son, Tim, led an effort four years later to allow family members to cash out. The family, now grown to about 75 members, representing several generations with different interests and needs, reluctantly supported the plan. In 2003, with newspapers still thought of as solid economic investments, the company went up for sale. A group of fourth generation Hoyle's family members wanted to keep control of the business and preserve its commitment to libertarianism. Bidding was fierce. The company was sold to a smaller family group. To swing the deal, the family needed to accept outside investors. The once debt-averse company also needed to borrow $1 billion to complete the $2 billion deal. Harry's son, Tim, walked away with $143 million. As debt payments came due, even though almost all of the individual properties remained profitable, the company struggled to make its payments. Classified advertising, once the foundation of newspaper revenue, all but collapsed. The internet grew in importance, decreasing print circulation and revenue. The subprime mortgage collapse hit freedom especially hard at its California and Florida properties. The deep, long-lasting recession sealed the company's fate. Bankruptcy was the only alternative. The remaining Hoyles family members lost everything. Today, with the debt reduced by 58% and expense controls in place, there is a new, leaner, aggressive company planning for a bright future. There is a new board of directors and new owners, but after 75 years, none of them goes by the name of Hoyles.